Imagine you're an experienced rock climber who's conquered so many challenging paths that you're even a bit bored. And one day, you purposely jump off a cliff and feel the most thrilling sensation in your entire life. The wind is messing with your hair, swooshing past your body, when suddenly, the rope that was supposed to stop you a few meters over the ground gets torn. You hit the rocks at full speed, you get dizzy, and everything fades before your eyes. The intolerable pain only lasts for a split second because, in just a moment, you're dead. To become famous as a singer, you need to hit a higher note. As a climber, to reach a higher spot. And what then? Then, rock climbing celebrities dare themselves to incredibly difficult challenges, which eventually result in tragedies. Today, I'm going to tell you about star rock climbers whose lives ended way too soon. As always, viewer discretion is advised. Rock climbing is a pretty hard sport that's challenging even for most adults to master. Yet this area can also boast its prodigies, whose talent for mountaineering emerged very early and was cut short early too. In 2019, Luce Duadi was just 15 years old when she took part in her first adult mountaineering competition. It was the European Cup in Innsbruck where the girl won the gold medal, which she hadn't expected. Then, she ended up one of the five best mountaineers at the Senior World Cup in Colorado, became a junior world champion in Italy, and won a bronze medal at the Senior European Championships. This is far from being the exhaustive list of her accolades. Luce's future in mountaineering was very promising, and she was quite famous in her circles. The girl was quite active on Instagram, where she published photos of her training and accomplishments. Luce's style of climbing was dynamic and decisive. One can even say that the girl was a prodigy in her sphere. If we use the French system of grading rock climbing routes by difficulty levels, in 2020, Luce reached the pro mark at 8B+. In the future, the girl could have become a strong player in the Olympic Games, since starting with 2020, this kind of sport was finally going to be added to the competition program. Yet at the time, she was still a carefree girl whose whole life was ahead of her and who wanted to spend it in a fun and active way. So on June 14th, she and her friends set out for the French Alps to have some fun and improve their athletic skills. The girl decided to climb the open route near the municipalities of Kral and St. Pancras. It was located between areas that were challenging for rock climbing. Luce knew the local rocks very well and had been there multiple times before, so nothing seemed to pose any threat until the girl slipped and fell from a height of almost 152 meters. She died on the spot from the sustained injuries. The global rock climbing community was shocked by this incident. Nobody could believe Luce could have let anything go wrong since she was the best in this sphere. Then the French authorities got on the case. They found that the girl must have installed her rope onto the handrails during a difficult passage. Still, Luce wasn't the youngest phenomenon in the mountaineering community. Another famous name in the sport is Tito Traversaw, and he's even younger than Luce. In 2008, Tito won his first title at a climbing competition at Promarock in Laco. He was able to conquer his first difficult route of the 8A level when he was nine years old. At 10, he reached 8B. And on March 29th, literally a month before his 11th birthday, Tito set a new world record of attaining 8B plus relative to age. This love for rock climbing was instilled in the boy by his father. And in 2013, when Tito was 12 years old, his dad bought him new quick draws for a rock climbing trip in France. Quick draws consist of two conjoined carabiners, one of which the climber attaches to the rock, and the other one is used to thread the safety rope through. It was with these quick draws that Tito went on a practice trip to the rocky area of Orpir, as part of a group consisting of 10 kids and three adults. To start with, they all had to conquer a 6B path as a warm-up before going to a more challenging spot. So, for Tito, it was a very easy task. Yet at some point, the boy fell off a 20-meter tall rock. The quick draws were supposed to stop the fall, but something went wrong, and Tito died. But why did this happen? Had the boy's father bought untested detective gear for his own child? No. As it turned out, that time, Tito was using somebody else's quick draws. Yet the main issue lay in the way the gear was installed. One of the adult instructors made a mistake. 
with 8 out of 10 quick draws. He threaded the carabiners only through the rubber keeper, instead of the sewed-on sling at the ends of the fixtures, designed to bear the climber's weight. That's why the court pressed charges of involuntary manslaughter of a child against six people. The owners of the rubber retainer manufacturing company, the mountaineering gear shop, the manager of the climbing club that organized the trip, the two instructors, as well as a relative of the girl who'd lent Tito her equipment. In the end, one of the instructors was sentenced to two years behind bars and had to cover the legal costs amounting to over 21,000 euros. As this was the man's first offense, in the end, he didn't even have to serve the sentence. Still, sometimes even mature age and years of experience can't save the lives of the world's most famous climbers. So, how do renowned climbers, who have already conquered the most challenging paths, set new records? For example, they may decide to go free solo climbing. It's a kind of climbing done by one person with no safety gear or help from other mountaineers whatsoever. Of course, this style is more dangerous than traditional climbing. So those who dare to go for it receive more recognition. For instance, John Backer bears the name of the free climbing legend. When he was still a teenager, Backer started free soloing on 5.11 difficulty level routes, according to the US grading system, back when 5.12 wasn't even on the system yet. If we sum up all of his ascents, we can say that in his career that spanned 30 years, John scaled 457 kilometers of rock without using any ropes. But what made him famous was the New Dimensions climb in the Yosemite National Park. John even offered $10,000 to whoever would repeat his free soloing feats. But no one took the risk of even trying. John single-handedly developed a free solo climbing training system, which ushered in a new era of athletes. Yet his system was most likely not without its flaws. In 2006, a fateful event happened in John's life. He and his business partner, Steve, had a car accident. Steve died, and Jeff managed to survive despite his numerous injuries. He was driving on that day, so he blamed himself. The only thing that put him at ease was rock climbing. He decided to go back to his favorite activity despite his neck injuries and poor psychological state. The climber lived near a granite rock named Dyke Wall, not far from Mammoth Lakes, California. So he went there to engage in his favorite sport and get his mind off things. As always, he decided to climb alone and without a safety rope, so it's unknown how his last training went. But soon, Jeff was found in a horrible state. Most likely, the climber was still too weak after the accident and unable to manage a simple ascent, which caused him to fall. Jeff couldn't even speak normally to explain what exactly had happened to him. We'll never find out since Jeff's life couldn't be saved. The world famous rock climber died in the hospital. Sadly, free solo climbing took the lives of many other climbers. On July 19th, 2004, a distraught Fred Butte called the save and rescue incident commander. Fred was extremely worried about his friend and frequent climbing partner, Dwight Bishop who was taking a long time to return from a solo ascent in the Grand Traverse. Fred knew Dwight had set out for the rocks back on July 16th and had planned to make the route in one day. Dwight was a professional climber and had a name among mountaineers because he'd conquered incredibly difficult routes like, for example, Iger Peak in the Bernese Alps. Yet Dwight directed most of his climbing efforts at the Teton Range in the northwest of the United States. He'd made a few ascents to the numerous peaks of this mountain range. Many of those trips were free soloing, and he'd climbed some of them in the winter when the simplest route can become slippery and dangerous. It seemed like nothing was out of Dwight's league, yet something inside kept Fred on edge. So he informed the rescue team. They found that Bishop's car was still at the start of the route on the Lupine Meadows. This could only mean one thing. The climber was most likely in trouble. On the very next day, a large group of rangers started the search mission. While descending from a ravine called Gunsight Notch, they encountered a group of mountaineers who said they'd found someone's backpack in the vicinity and left it where it was. The rangers found it at an altitude of 1,807 meters, and 15 meters above, Dwight's dead body was found. Judging by its position, the man had fallen off a rock, and that's the scariest thing about free soloing. If anything happens, there'll be nobody there to catch and help you. Michael Reardon's parents realized their son would be a rock climber back when he, still a child, 
climbed the boulders in his grandfather's backyard. When Michael got older, he discovered a passion for trips into the Rockies and the Appalachian Mountains. Eventually, Michael decided to take on a route that scored 5.7 on the difficulty scale. But he had neither mountaineer friends to accompany him, nor any gear of his own. So Reardon set out on the route alone, with no safety gear or rope, and he succeeded. After that, Michael engaged in hundreds of solo climbs on challenging rock routes with no mock climbs and training that most mountaineers partake in. He said he could scale around 5,000 meters of vertical rock in one day. Yet, his envious colleagues didn't believe Mike, saying that he was making it all up and that there was no reason to believe any loud statements without sufficient proof. After that, Mike started taking sports photographers with him on all of his climbs to make it impossible for anyone to doubt his achievements. Mike put the end to the argument when he conquered a famous route called Romantic Warrior in the Needles, located in the Sequoia National Forest, California. The mountaineers who use ropes and safety gear usually spend an entire day scaling up 244 meters of the vertical granite rock. But Reardon, equipped with only his mountaineering shoes and a bag of chalk, finished the ascent in less than two hours. And here's his eloquent photo report for the detractors. On July 13, 2007, Michael, accompanied by a photographer, set out in search of new accomplishments to the southwestern coast of Ireland. They arrived on Valencia Island, where Mike would free solo climb the rocks near the Atlantic Ocean. Yet suddenly, a fog descended, so the visibility worsened and the rocks became moist and slippery. But this didn't stop Mike. The photos taken against the backdrop of the roaring waves were breathtaking. The climber finished two ascents and was waiting on a seaweed-covered ledge to be able to return to the photographer on the other side of the harbor and go home. Suddenly, a giant wave entered the harbor and hit Mike. He tried to gain some footing on the ledge, but the water swept him off his feet. In mere seconds, the current took the man 150 meters away from the shore. Help arrived at the spot of the incident in less than 15 minutes, but by that time, Mike was nowhere to be seen. 12 volunteer rescue boats, a Coast Guard boat, and a helicopter equipped with an infrared scanner worked at the site until dark. The following day, the Navy divers arrived. They searched a large area of the ocean, but Reardon was never found. The sad irony was that Michael wasn't scaling a rock when the wave took him, but if he had been using a rope and hadn't been disconnected from it when standing on that ledge, this tragedy could have been avoided. Still, there's a story about a climber who came up with a different way of using a rope during the ascent, but his system didn't make the activity safer, quite the opposite. On October 26, 1998, 12-year-old Emma Osmond called her father, the famous rock climber, Dan Osmond, all covered in tears. The girl saw terrifying footage of her father descending rocks without any safety gear, or even worse, falling into the abyss while tied to a rope. Right away, Dan traveled from Yosemite to Gardnerville to calm her down, but he carried on with his stunts. Dan had started his career as an ordinary mountaineer, but eventually got into solo climbing. Very soon though, he got bored with it as well. Then, Dan became serious about rope jumping off bridges or cliffs. Osman even did them for ad videos. However, he didn't make much. For example, Osman paid the doctor who treated his constant small injuries like fractured ribs and ankles with the jackets and shoes he received from the sponsors. The man was even arrested for his many fines, for instance, for breaking traffic regulations. He was, so to speak, a cool bad guy who liked to take risks in everything. So, when even rope jumping became boring for him, Dan came up with his own complex rope installation systems. They distributed the load during a jump in a way that enabled the jumper to fall from such great heights that nobody ever dared to jump from using the regular mountaineering ropes. Moreover, unlike bungee jumping, in Dan's system, when the jumpers fell, the rope stopped them very close to the ground. This style was called body hurling or controlled free falling. Osman started developing this technique and nudging other climbers to try the new activity. He always pre-stretched new ropes with a series of short falls to determine their maximum length. Yet in 1994, a mountaineer named Bobby Tarver, who was trying out Dan's new style, stretched a previously unused rope to such an extent that it smashed into the canyon wall, killing him on the spot. 
the court found no reason to blame Osman for Bobby's death. This incident was supposed to at least make him a bit more wary, but that didn't happen. Osman appeared to be possessed by these jumps. Still, on the day when he was soothing his crying daughter, he did have a passing thought of what would happen if he were to die. When Dan got back to California, park rangers took him into custody for his non-payment of fines. Dan's friends gathered the bail money for him, and his film director friend, Eric Perlman, even promised to pledge his own house to get Dan to promise he'd fix the mess his life was in. Yet it wasn't too long before new trouble. The rangers made Dan dismantle a jump tower he'd built in Yosemite under the threat of confiscation. Dan climbed the rock, but instead of fulfilling the order, Osman decided to perform a 282-meter jump using the ropes that had been hanging in the rain and snow for over a month. Such ropes are used on Mount Everest, so the man was sure he'd be okay under such humid, frosty conditions. And the jump did go smoothly. The following evening, Dan forgot all about dismantling the tower and was planning to do a record-breaking jump, during which he'd end up even closer to the ground. But this time, Osman jumped at an angle he hadn't tried before. Dan's friends were on the top of the rock at that moment, and they saw his flashlight vanish into the darkness. Ten seconds later, the rope straightened, and a scream reached their ears from below. At first, they thought Dan had gotten caught on a branch and hurt himself. After descending, his friends saw the torn end of the rope hanging down from the branches. Then, he noticed Osman peacefully lying on his side. The friend checked his pulse and found that Dan's heart was no longer beating. To this day, many people regard Osman as the world's best rock climber who pursued his goal and was fearless even in the face of death. But this thought is far from being shared by everyone. Some think Dan was nothing more than a stunt enthusiast who drove his tricks to mindless extremes, ignoring the possible consequences. What do you think? Write in the comments, and of course, subscribe to my channel to avoid missing new videos about hobbies that may cost you your life.